Welcome everyone to another day here at the Damage Report. I'm John Arola and it being Friday and all, hey Brett Ehrlich, how's it going? I am so happy and jazzed to be here with you, John. Just seeing your face brings me such joy because you're such a dear heart, a nobleman, a kind soul. Thank you for those compliments that were delivered with just a slight. Paul, John, um, and that's not my intent. It's just how I am as a person. Even though my I'm last aware. name means honest, it's very <laughs> difficult for people to consider what I say as honesty. I've experienced that. I appreciate you putting, you know, uh, you know, a strong face forward. Is that the expression? Considering that you in the last week have binged the entirety of Attack on Titan, and now you are facing a gaping void where Attack on Titan once was. I don't know what to do person. with myself after I finished all the episodes of Attack on Titan in a painfully short amount of time. I spent time on archive.org just to just to take What's my, on there? my just to lose my soul in it. Just okay. I, I was able to be wildly productive in my actual job, not thinking about when I could get off and watch more Attack, Attack on Titan. <laughs> Okay, uh, so your life has become simpler recently. Uh, in any event, uh, we're gonna be talking about some things not related to Attack on Titan on the show today. Other things will be related to Attack on Titan. No, we're gonna be talking about some of the legal developments when it comes to Donald Trump, who has made uh, arguably the most explicit call for violence ever. And I say this fully aware that January 6th was a thing that happened. Um, aside from that, we have uh, some strong pushback from people like Representative uh, Ocasio-Cortez and Raskin when it comes to book bans. And then paired up with that, should the Bible be banned for the same sorts of obscenity that right wingers are trying to ban any number of other books for? We've got stuff about guns and about trains and uh, you know, all, oh, also as always, our garbage people of the week. So that will be coming in the aftermath. Everyone tune into that. And along the way, if you want to send us any comments, tweets, or super chats, we would love to hear from you. Questions, comments, concerns, or a chance at a $100 Blue Apron gift card. We'll be giving one of those away at some point today. With all that said, Brett, you ready to talk about the news? Let's get into it, John, with my best pal. With let's let's together forward, palsies forever. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> It's Friday and so it's looking like Donald Trump will not in fact as he predicted or lied, uh, is not gonna be arrested this week. But that doesn't mean he's not gonna throw a few more bombs, including what I'm about to read to you, which I believe without exaggeration, I think is the most explicit call to violence that I've seen from Donald Trump. A guy who has rarely been shy when it comes to calls for chaos and violence against his political opponents or persecutors, he bleated. What kind of person can charge another person, in this case, a former president of the United States who got more votes than any sitting president in history? Uh, but no, uh, Joe Biden is a sitting president and he got way more votes than you. So that's factually inaccurate. And leading candidate by far of the Republican Party nomination with a crime when it is known by all that no crime has been committed. And also known that potential death and destruction in such a false charge could be catastrophic for our country. He goes on. But I'm gonna stop there. He is saying there is potential death and destruction if he is charged in this way. He'll throw in the word false charge. We know that it's not a false charge. I don't know that he necessarily can be successfully prosecuted when it comes to it, but it's definitely not a false charge. They did the hush money payments, that is indisputable. So Brett, um, I will admit, as I've had to occasionally over the past few years, that even I, a person who pledged years ago to never be fair to Donald Trump, and a person who definitely is plagued by a terminal Trump derangement syndrome, um, initially this sort of just slid past me. Oh, it's him being him again. But this is so much worse than protest, protest, protest. He is threatening the prosecutor, which by the way, as others have pointed out, is literally a crime in New York, threatening a prosecutor. And this is not the only threat, we're gonna get to more. But this call for death and destruction is definitely not going to be over the line for most Republicans. But how could it not be? The strange alchemy of Donald Trump's brand is he has been able to really craft this persona where he gets away with saying stuff like this because he's such a and such a ridiculous person that you know back when you used to think of to yourself of what is a politician like a politician is someone who who is very manicured and careful about everything that they say and trying to make the perfect sense so they don't get in trouble or 
and aid anyone whatsoever and they walk the line even even ridiculously so where they like repeat themselves when they're asked to give a specific answer and they're evading it. They they say the same thing. I would love to answer that question, but it is important for us to blah blah blah. Donald Trump has because he is an uh, you know world wrestling entertainment style persona He's able to say stuff like this and folks just are like, I guess there's no crime there. There's no explicit crime. And because of that, uh, he's just talking like these ethereal terms that, that won't end up getting him in trouble. That's It's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, he has this particular aura that makes him immune to the sorts of things that would be big issues for other people. He just does, including things that He's calling for death and destruction. He's not calling for death and destruction. Don't you see, John? But I think that's Can a specific I wish that way to I be had careful. More of. eyes to roll. <laughs> yes, he's, he's not, not calling for death and destruction. Literally calling for it. Don't he's you threatening see? Threatening it. It's he's not threatening threat. it. Don't you see, John? He's just making the very clear uh, observation that no one in their right mind would disagree with that Donald Trump's Supporters uh, will commit crimes, will kill people, and destroy things. And he is aware of that. Yeah. He feels no sense of responsibility to avoid that death and destruction. And I will mm-hmm. remind you that, like, none, none of his claims are necessarily true. The idea that he is about to be arrested is not necessarily true. It hasn't played out. He made this whole thing up. Don't you see? He yeah, we're, said, gonna, we're gonna get to more of that in, okay. in a little bit when we get to Alvin Bragg. Um, I just wanna remind people of some of the other, uh, I'm gonna say threatening language, feel free to disagree. Or imagery, for instance, this. This is really ambiguous. This can be read on so many levels. This image that Trump bleated out of him holding a baseball bat aiming at Alvin Bragg, the, the prosecutor that's looking at him right now. I don't remember, what's the mob movie where the guy kills a man with a baseball bat? The untouchables. The untouchables, thank you. So I was gonna say that the earlier implication of chaos and violence, if you were to pursue him, is very much like a mobster. He decided to make that comparison a little bit more direct. I will also remind you that he recently referred to Alvin Bragg as an animal and also as a Soros backed uh, prosecutor. There's no indication that Soros has any prov- provided any uh, direct uh, financial support. Um, but you just have to remember that for the Republicans, the threat of violence, racism, and anti-Semitism go together like pick a thing. I don't know, but he's he's done a lot of it, and it's had maybe very minor immediate consequences. In that, when again invoking sort of the specter of violence against the government, um, he's doing this rally in Waco on the, I believe, 30th anniversary um, of that tragedy. And GOP leaders in Texas are not gonna be going. They say they have prior commitments. So I think unless they're just being honest, which I doubt, uh, this is the most that we're gonna see in terms of pushback. Especially as in recent weeks, it has become increasingly clear that it really does look like it's gonna be Trump again. DeSantis is starting to sputter a little bit before he's even launched. And so this is a guy who's going into the race I'll say threatening violence, I don't know. Or there's an implication of violence to come. Yeah, I I think that Donald Trump is really wowing all his friends and supporters with this really cool image of him about to hit a guy with a baseball bat. Because Trump's tough, he did play baseball when he was in his younger days. He actually did do athletic things, but as anyone who has seen him recently, will say the only thing he's swinging is a golf club. And in terms of the folks in Waco and beyond in Texas who are saying they have prior commitments, in a prior election cycle, they would cancel everything. They would avoid their going to their kid's sweet 16 birthday party to get some face time with Donald Trump. And right now we're in the phase of the electoral cycle where they are hoping against hope not to get dragged into this boring, horrible stuff anymore. At worst and at best, they're like, I, I'm just gonna wait it out and see if he gets the support from the popular, or either gets the popular support that would force the hand of these uh, play it safe politicians to then eventually have to side with Satan, mm-hmm. essentially. Yeah, um, I'll remind people, this is, this is what he's saying 
before he's been arrested before. And again, maybe if he even is arrested, which isn't necessarily guaranteed, the entire thing might flame out, it might be a complete disaster. And maybe all the right wing dreams of that falling apart then makes like the Fulton County thing less likely or you know, uh, the impending rape case. Maybe that harms those, there's no reason why it should, but our country is insane, so why not? Um, but that said, if it doesn't go in that direction, and if he is feeling more pressure, then God only knows what he'll be messaging to his followers then. But I do wanna to turn to the other side of this. Earlier this week, Republican leaders, including Jim Jordan, were pressuring uh, Alvin Bragg, the uh, DA looking into Donald Trump when it comes to the hush money payments, to now testify before Congress because it's because they like Trump and they want to defend him. That's basically it. Well, he has now responded to it, saying the investigation into Trump, quote, has been conducted consistently with the district attorney's oath to faithfully execute the laws of the state of New York. But the Republicans' letter was an unprecedented inquiry into a pending local prosecution, and quote, only came after Donald Trump created a false expectation that he would be arrested the next day, and his lawyers reportedly urged you to intervene. Neither fact is a legitimate basis for congressional inquiry. He also, by the way, even though it doesn't seem like this would be necessary, pointed out why he as a state official is allowed to look into these sorts of things. He laid out the laws empowering his office to conduct prosecutions, the quote, quintessential police powers belonging to the state, and accused the Republicans of treading into territory very clearly reserved to the states with an indefensible congressional inquiry that was being quote, conducted solely for the personal why am I having aggrandizement. Aggrandizement, thank you. Uh, of the investigators or to punish those investigated, which is obvious. And by the way, like if you don't like Jim Jordan, it's clear why he's doing this. If you like Jim Jordan, first of all, seek help. Also, you know why he's doing this. Everyone on every side of this understands why it's proceeding the way that it is when it comes to congressional Republicans. Um, but they do not, so far as I know, have any capacity to stop him from doing this investigation. Which also, again, might flame out in a million different ways. And we have very good reason to believe that it will, considering how everything in America has gone over the past five years or so. What do you think, Brett? It is very obvious that people like Jim Jordan only exist to put their face on camera, talk very fast, and hope people don't remember that he was at the Ohio State University when assault claims, sexual assault allegations arose. That is obvious. What's fascinating is that this investigation was triggered not by investigative reporting, not by actual proven inside sources, not by any of that, but by Donald Trump saying, I'm going to get arrested. Which, Mm -hmm. based on intelligence Trump has acted on in the past in multiple situations, he's not great at really vetting his sources. (laughs) <laughs> and 63, 700, however many court cases he's tried to bring before a judge regarding his own election, those have failed. The guy's not trustworthy with any of this. I'm not convinced that they were actually going to indict him. But even if it's true they were going to indict him, Jim Jordan is going to do this nonsense no matter what. They have like the committee, committee to investigate the committee to investigate the committee. <laughs> going on in Congress, and this is at the same time when they say there's too many committees and too many government investigations. It's nonsense, it's stupid. This is all just a chance for people on the right to play martyr so that they can say, Donald Trump, it's so oh, unfair for him, and I'm a victim too, even though I have everything <laughs> going for me. And then people who are kind of like non, people who aren't really suffering the consequences of the day to day fallout of the Donald Trump administration. People in big cities are like, "Oh my God, I just wanna see him get arrested. And mm-hmm. for better or for worse, I think that's kind of fun. Like it would be fun to watch him get arrested. What does it mean for everybody who's talking about the slippery slope of like locking up your, um, your political opponents? You have no leg to stand on because Donald Trump got into office saying lock her up, lock her up for stuff that was, Essentially, like, where was your email server? Yeah. Like, what are we talking yeah. about? And the only and the conclusion I can make is discourse in America, this show aside, is just so damn stupid. No one has their eyes on any eyes. Yeah, including this program. 
but anyway, um, and because especially because I agree with you, it would be fun now. And 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 him coming into office, you know, with the locker up does not mean that he thereby deserves retribution. The the charges still have to be accurate, um, and that's why we've said from the very beginning that other people can have a preference as to which of the many investigations would be the one that would result in him being arrested. Um, I personally feel like stuff having to do with January 6th, the call to George is the most the most worrying when it comes to the future of democracy. But yeah, no, he doesn't just get to be immune to the law because he's prominent. That's not how, I was gonna say that's not how it works. No, that is how it works. That's not how it should work, to be clear. Anyway, um, while we cannot yet deliver to Brett the fun that would be him being arrested, perhaps you can draw a little bit of schadenfreude from this. As Donald Trump awaits possible arrest that might never come, and as we all await a word of what's really going on here, apparently his closest partner, the person he is most devoted to, is sort of keeping out of it at this point. Melania um, Trump, according to sources close to her, is reportedly keeping to herself and avoiding any talk of the ongoing legal woes, at least in regard to the hush money payments. She apparently isn't interested in commiserating with her husband, which I'm sure he's doing 24 seven, and is instead focused on a small close knit group of friends and family, including Baron Trump. Quote, according to one source, she doesn't sympathize with Donald's plight. And while I don't necessarily have an overabundance of empathy to throw towards someone who has affiliated themselves with Donald Trump for literally decades, um, I understand why she wouldn't sympathize with him. It's about hush money payments to cover up an affair that happened four months after she gave birth to their child. That would be a sensitive topic, I think. Um, apparently, she is, quote, leading her own life and still feels happy being at Mar-a-Lago, surrounded by people who love her and who never talk about reality or bad things about her husband. So I am assuming that in the same way that Donald Trump is not gonna allow people to tell him things that are politically inconvenient, uh, Melania Trump probably does not, I, and I think rightly does not want to be reminded of this uh, you know, ongoing scandal involving her husband's infidelity. I don't think that Melania is upset that Donald Trump cheated on her. I don't think that Melania is upset that Donald Trump treated on her right after she gave birth to their child. I think Melania Trump is mad that this is a public case in which he cheated on her with someone she deems to be trashy and messy and gross. Yeah. That's what I think. I think Melania who spends her time now after emerging from Slovenia to the heights of the fashion industry and and gold plated toilet world just looks at, at Stormy Daniels and goes, with her, you told this lady who is having sex with my husband. That's what I think. I don't. I. I. I don't. I don't pretend to understand how the minds of incredibly rich, powerful people work. I would assume that if I were her, I would be boiling over the infidelity, particularly at that point. I don't know. That's just. That's how I would react. It's. Um, it's the. I don't care that. In my opinion. I think she's like Donald, I don't care. I definitely don't wanna have sex with you any more than I had to to secure my ongoing alimony payments for the rest of my life and child support should this go boobies up. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's mad that it's in, that she's embarrassed. It's like either keep it in your pants or keep it under wraps. And sure. definitely if you're having sex with a porn, porn star, I mean every potential interpretation of keep it under wraps. <laughs> Wrap it hey, up, hey, John. Hey. Wrap but it up. No, I, I, I do agree with you in terms of sex, of sex positive, and I think you should support my my take on that. I'm gonna push forward. Um, but I do agree that yeah, one of one of the things about infidelity that is doubly terrible for the victim is the you know whether it's merited or not. I don't think that she should be ashamed of what this other horrible person did, but that does make it harder. I think at the same time. Um, and apparently they uh, we're not surprised to find this out. Uh, they live in separate quarters in Mar-a-Lago. Granted, there's room for it there, I suppose. Uh, they do still eat dinner together and attend events at the private club. They apparently see their friends for dinner. And the most amazing part about that is friends? Like people who are like just socially want to hang out with Melania and Donald. I don't understand that. I don't it. see it, but I think socially you have to think about society more than you have to think about social. You know what I mean? Sure, like what yeah, is society, yeah. like these society, people are yeah. in society and so that's what friend means at a certain point sure. of uh, social class and clout. Yeah, I assume I've never been in society, um, nor do I expect to ever be. Uh, but it definitely, it has feelings that like I'm prepping for, I'm gonna be vague. 
topic. No, I guess it could still be spoilers for Succession season four. I feel like there's sort of a parallel there to how they must be feeling anyway when it comes to the man betraying his wife. Anyway, with that said, we do need to take our first break. When we come back, we're gonna be talking about the book bans and some Democrats pushing back against it as well as a parent trying to flip the entire thing on its head to score some rhetorical points. We'll have that for you more after this. Been a while since we've heard a dragon roar. In any event, thank you, everyone. We've got a lot more news to get to. If you're just joining us now, please hit the like button as we proceed into this. The life of Rosa Parks. This apparently is too woke by the Republican Party. Song of Solomon is is unacceptable to Republican politics. Forty percent of banned books have report, reported are significantly addressing and specifically addressing LGBT issues. It is good to see on the national stage some pushback against the insane censorship and not just censorship. It's bad. Banned, author, banned, entire subjects, entire courses of study being banned in places like Florida and in others. And now we have the Republicans trying to push forward this bill, the Parents Bill of Rights Act, which we're gonna give you more details on uh, to begin this process at the national level. AOC has more to say about this, take a look. Quote unquote, parental rights and freedom hides the sinister fact of this legislative text. If you notice in these arguments, they are not really discussing what is actually in this legislation. It includes two provisions that require schools to out trans, non-binary, and LGBT youth, even if it would put said youth in harm's way. One of the highest rates of youth homelessness is in in the LGBT community. From parents who want to kick their children out in, in households that may be unstable or abusive. For so many children of abuse, school is their only safe place to be. When we talk about progressive values, I can say what my progressive value is, and that is freedom over fascism. So look, we need we need that. We need what AOC had to say. We need that every day. We need that at the state level. We need that all over. People making clear what's actually happening now. And this intersects, I think, really well with the the dissection of the modern use of this word woke. Um, can you imagine if the Republicans' plan was um, we're just going to put forward, we're going to start banning books that were written by black authors, by gay authors, by trans authors. We're just going to do that because we don't like those. I hope that that would be unacceptable. And so they found a way to cloak it to accomplish the same goal. They want to take entire massive swaths of humanity and make them basically legally not able to exist in the public sphere, for their work to not exist, for it not to be taught. It would not be acceptable if they were even slightly more explicit about their goal, but they've cloaked it in this vague language. And now you have this parent bill of rights act. Require schools to provide parents with a list of books and reading materials available in the school library, which, based on my experience going to libraries throughout my life, is available. It's the Dewey Decimal System. They have an entire log of all of the books. Most of these are now computerized, um, as well as posting curriculum publicly. It would require elementary and middle schools that receive federal funding to obtain parental consent before, quote, changing a minor child's gender markers, pronouns, or preferred name on any school form, or allowing a child to change the child's sex based accommodations, including locker rooms or bathrooms. It would also affirm parents' rights to, they say, address, I'll say, berate school boards and receive information about violent activity in their child's school, which is important. You need that information before you do as and stop anything from being done to stop the violence. And so AOC also points out the human cost of this. And from the very beginning, Republicans haven't given a damn about the kids who are going to be perhaps abused, maybe kicked out, disowned by their parents as a result of them wanting to identify with the the, the way that they do. Brett, what do you think? Uh, I think that this was the plan, the plan the whole time was for them to 100% make it so that they could ban these books. These books that give people of any civil rights, 
that advocate for understanding and compassion for anyone's experience to see the eyes through to see the world through anyone else's eyes. That is what literature is about. And the reason for that is because fundamentally, as I understand it, in its current is the opposite of the good guy wins. In conservative art, they want their it's all a media play so people like Ben Shapiro can start their own media houses. It's a play for folks that don't want justice to happen. In a conservative version of Superman, Lex Luthor kills the alien who's trying to stop him from realizing his own Ayn Randian business goals. <laughs> and and then that that's that makes them so angry that kids who just see things and understand them totally understand it. They they, they get it. And and they 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 would reject a story where the bad guy wins. And so rather than and better and and understand the value of empathy and all the themes in these books, the right wing just wants to silence them, which is hilariously yeah. ironic because they champion themselves as the proponents of free speech when all they want to do is censor everything that challenges their ideas. Exactly. Yeah, and it leaves you with a whole cadre of people who put out specials, books, and podcasts called Triggered, talking about all the things nobody's allowed to learn about anymore. Um, in any event, while what AOC had to say was great and important, we she wasn't the only one uh, with powerful commentary. Let's jump to Representative uh, Jamie Raskin. Kyle Leto saying he's the kite runner about the dangerous fanaticism, authoritarianism, and abuse of the Taliban, a right-wing religious fundamentalist movement, all about censorship and repressing women's control over their own bodies and their own fertility. The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood's extraordinary dystopian novel about a right-wing misogynist movement which uses high technology and depraved religious ideology to control not only the minds of their followers, but the, <clears throat> but the private and public lives and the fertility of women. And of course, George Orwell's 1984, because they have no sense of irony. They're always trying to censor this one. Mr. Chairman, we, time's expired. We, we need more politicians reading books Gentlemen's in America time. and fewer politicians trying to censor books in mm -hmm. America. Just as a general rule, if I was gonna go around censoring thousands of books, I would just not do 1984 because I feel like that makes the entire thing too obvious. But then I'm not trying to do challenge mode on the gallop towards fascism, I guess. So yeah, they have. And by the way, it's not like Republicans just started trying to ban 1984 and books like The Handmaid's Tale. Those books have been challenged by literally decades by all sorts of people. So that is true, but they've also gotten caught up um, in this, and so thank you to Representative Raskin. You know, obviously, in some cases in that video, had difficulty still undergoing chemotherapy and all that. Um, in speaking forcefully against the censorship, Brett, what do you think? In my opinion, call me crazy, but banning Orwell, it's kind of Orwellian. <laughs> it seems like it. And which seems is like it, guys? Which is it, right wing? Do I need to read 1984 so I can understand what's going on in this double? speak word police world or should I not read 1984 because you're literally banning it? Which is it? And that's why I say we are at the stupidest point in in discourse in America. Used for depraved points in political discourse where it was just like you can't be, you have to be, you have to do this and you have to do that. Or or, or like like literally segregation. Now we're just at a dumb point where mm -hmm. because folks are just so jazzed to tweet something angry or like be like because they are it's so easy to feel like you have the right answer when you're putting something online or interacting with folks in a digital world you you, you don't realize you've become a 100% fundamentalist. Yeah. You have your fundies in a bunch. Here's um, I also want to give people just a few of the facts, the updated facts that are recent. 
in 2022, uh, 20 titles for censorship. That was up from the year before. I have to assume the only explanation for that is that books are 40% more obscene than they used to be. Uh, a vast majority of the targeted books were written by or were about members of the LGBTQ community and people of color. 90% of the individual challenges involved multiple books at a time. Now, why does that matter? Well, the ALA said that the skyrocketing number of challenges is in part the result of the use of book lists compiled by censorship groups, which exist. Again, probably believe that they are in favor of freedom and against cancel culture, but they're literally organized to censor books around the country. Prior to 2021, most challenges involved a single book. And what's the difference between those two things? Look, I don't necessarily agree with reading a book and then wanting it to be censored. At least implies that the person is familiar with the book. When this is people who are just taking lists of books that they have never read, would never read, and never have any intent to learn anything about, and then saying nobody who lives near me should ever read these books that I refuse to read. Well, then you've fallen really far from the, the position of moral superiority that you uh, probably assume that you that you stand on. And, uh, and we really are seeing this all over. It cannot just be a thing where we're acting defensively in response to these. We need to have more and more places, and there is one state that's working on this right now that is uh, doing laws to ban these sorts of blanket book bans and removing entire curricula from, um, from schools. So anyway, it is rapidly spreading uh, at a pace even worse than we might have feared. Welcome back everyone to what comes after tech apocalypse. Some sort of major stream or audio issues, but everybody behind the scenes is trying to get it uh, working as, as good as possible, as fast as possible. And I think Brett, it's working. Assuming I can hear you, say a word and let's see what happens. Today. Nice, nice, okay, it works. Um, so very glad to have you here, Brett. Everyone out there, th thank you for dealing with us. Um, I saw people posting conspiracy theories about leftist audio. <laughs> So I don't know what's going on. Uh, Skype is a hell of a technology, um, but in Skype's defense, it's only been around for once or kings. Anyway, with that said, we're gonna push forward with uh, our news and see how much we can get to. As always, the aftermath will feature the garbage people of the week, so definitely stick around for that. With that said, why don't we jump into this? A parent in Utah has filed a request to ban a book, which wouldn't necessarily be newsworthy. Parents are doing that all over the place, but it's the book that they're wanting to ban, and that is the Bible. They want it banned from schools, citing a law that was passed last year that removed dozens of books already from schools and libraries in just the last year. They wrote in their request for the Bible to be removed, get this porn out of our schools. And bear in mind, in 2022, Utah passed a look banning books with quote, pornographic or indecent content. The initial list of banned books included many titles that featured coming of age stories that also deal with themes of sexuality and gender. As in a lot of other states, these laws are being passed to strip entire sorts of books, sorts of authors, particularly people of color and members of the LGBTQ community. And there for the Bible, they say it includes incest, Onanism, bestiality, prostitution, genital mutilation, fellatio, dildos, rape, and, I, and even infanticide. You'll no doubt find that the Bible under the new Utah code has no serious value for minors because it's pornographic by our new definition. And they say, I thank the Utah legislature and Utah Parents United, one of the groups behind it, for making this bad faith process so much easier and way more efficient. Now we can all ban books and you don't even need to read them or be accurate about it. Heck, you don't even need to see the book. Seeding our children's education, First Amendment rights, and library access to a white supremacist hate group like Utah Parents United seems like a wonderful idea for a school district literally under investigation for being racist. And uh, yeah, so obviously it's not a serious attack against it. And I'm not even 100% certain that school libraries would contain the, the Bible, but the, a lot of these bans go beyond just school libraries anyway. So Brett, what do you think? I am 100% uh, and I don't think we should stop at the Bible. We all know that the cat in the hat is not talking about the cat's head being in the hat. He's doing horrible things to that hat. Um, I think there's a, a book, a children's book called Are You My Mother? 
and that's should be getting gotten rid of because of you know it, it's one single parent households and then not paternity tests and that's a little bit too much to talk to kids about. I think also calling it infanticide in the Bible is really underselling the true wrath of the Lord. Because it wasn't, you know, there's people might be thinking, oh, God had a weird thing about killing kids. Like there was one weird, like April Fool's joke God pulls where he's like, if you love me, if you really love me, you should kill one of your kids for me. And then he steps in and is like, at the last second, no, that was just a joke. I wanted to see if you really cared. <laughs> Not to mention later on in the history of humanity when. <laughs> Passover story is that mm. like you have to sacrifice sheep babies and paint them over the door of your house or else God will kill your human babies. Like that's really weird. There's a lot of infanticide in the Bible and uh, I am yeah. for anyone who, who tries to ban it on the same terms because it really does expose the ridiculousness uh, that is not just a fringe thing of the Republican party. This is a way into their hearts. This is the explicit strategy of people like Ron DeSantis and and Donald Trump and Fox News and everyone in establishment level uh, communication on the right. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, when you bring up some of the examples of what's actually in it, you know, it's very easy for us to look back and and you know be shocked by the things that were in books and TV shows and movies in the past. But sometimes you look and you just think. How was that ever okay? How did anyone think that that was acceptable thousand years ago? Um, but I like it being used in this this clever use. Again, it's not gonna it's not gonna be banned, and I don't think books should be banned. I don't think religious text should be banned. Um, but if you can do this in a way that maneuvers your opponents into looking even more ridiculous, I think that that can be a good call. And that happened on a very personal level in this. It's not just a good sort of like meta commentary in the book bans, but in response to this proposed ban of the Bible. Representative Ken Ivory, uh, the chief sponsor of the bill, called the parents' request another example of, quote, antics that drain school resources. And here is a picture uh, of Ken Ivory. Quote, this stuff, it's very unfortunate. There are any number of studies that directly link sexualization and hypersexualization with sexual exploitation and abuse. Certainly those things we don't want in schools for people to minimize that and to make a mockery of it is very sad. Sure, sure. Look, I think that this is an example of antics that drain school resources, both the push to ban the Bible as well as the entire GD thing. All of this is a waste of time for school employees and teachers who did not have an overabundance of time to waste to begin with. And these issues of child abuse and sexual abuse are very serious. To then make a mockery of the reality of it by pretending that Gay second grade teachers are the chief source of child abuse in America is making a mockery of one of the most serious issues facing kids in America. And so Ken Ivory, I'm, I'm trying to avoid making some fairly obvious jokes right now, looks ridiculous because he's part of a ridiculous political movement. It's so, I don't know what's sad or if they actually believe it or if they're trying to out, but both are equally evil in the eyes of the Lord. And when God told Noah to get together two of every animal to wipe the slate clean in one of the one of the most amazing mass genocides in all of the Bible. A book that has plenty mass genocides in it. Yeah. Do you think he would save you? Do you think he would save you, Ken Ivory? I don't think so. Not the not the person who is doing anything in the name of the Lord and freedom that is absolutely disingenuous at worst and misguided at best. And yeah. um, when I say best, it's still pretty bad. It's just sometimes the universe dishes up irony. The idea that this group, which the, that parent is referring to as a white supremacist group, which is trying to ban many different types of authors, but in particular uh, people of color, that their champion in that would have a name that means white. Yeah. <laughs> It's almost too perfect. Thank you, universe. Uh, we got some, I think, for yeah, one more story. I think we'll push forward with, uh, with with the D block, what we plan to talk about. So whenever we're ready, why don't we jump into this? Yes. 
What you just saw is a brief snippet of a father of a victim in the Parkland mass shooting who lost his son, Manuel Oliver, being arrested, being brutalized in that particular way because he committed the crime of interfering with a Second Amendment related hearing that was ongoing. So Manuel Oliver ended up getting like barred from the place and then you know, driven to the ground. And we don't know exactly what immediately led up to it. That's the only video that we have. Um, but we do know is that he was the only member of his family who was treated incredibly poorly by the Republicans managing this hearing. Um, Patricia Oliver also uh, ended up getting hauled out of the room. Take a look at this. When I decide to be a mom, I am a mom all the way. I don't need to be from anyone. Officers, we have Yeah, so look, uh, the, the chairman, Chairman Fallon said he didn't know who was speaking when he said, I believe the words were remove that woman, which really sums up, I think, right wing politics uh, in the modern era. Um, but the idea that there would be no empathy remaining from these Republicans for these two parents who've gone through an unimaginable tragedy. I don't know how, as the parent of someone who died in one of these shootings, you can sustain years of activism, years of activism which hold the hope of reform, but also are a constant reminder of the worst thing to ever happen to you and your family. And so the fact that they persist years later and receive so little assistance, so little, you know, just common decency, it just sucks. And this is, by the way, this is a hearing about guns. It's the quote, ATF's assault on the Second Amendment, when is enough enough? So even when you can finally get a hearing on guns under the Republicans, it's about how the ATF is being unfair. Right, what do you think? It's not a hearing. The way that they labeled the hearing means they're not there to hear it sure. from you. And if it's you- It's a speaking. <laughs> it's a speaking, it's no, it's just, it's just stupid. It's just a nothing. And when someone tried to make it a something, that person was pushed to the ground and arrested violently. This stuff happens yeah. all the time, by the way, in, in the halls of Congress and in sure. any place. Someone comes in at the at the back and it says something, and then they have to be taken out because you know order in the court. Um, and the people, typically Republicans in these situations, when they're having hearings about gun safety, that they are bigger victims than the people that the folks in the back shouting are trying to give a voice to, who died in a place where there should have been safety as well. Their school. And it is insane to me that in this in this current environment, the right wing thinks that the biggest victims is, is them, and the biggest culprit is books. When really the biggest threat to the safety of children in our schools is is firearms. And yeah. when folks try to, in a uh, you know good faith effort, get protections for people. In a place that should be sacred and safe, the Republicans literally call it government overreach from the jump before they have a chance to hear anything. Yeah, yeah. By the way, it it, it really does feel like, you know, hypocrisy doesn't matter as much as I think it should. I don't know what your position on Ben has never cared about. It. He thinks it's very natural, and I get it. He's been following politics for longer than me. Um, but if you're going to have, for instance, like a movement against cancel culture. And then you immediately pivot to banning books and banning entire topics and banning being able to reference that Rosa Parks is black or whatever. It feels like that should be like fatal hypocrisy. If you're going to have a movement, which the slogan is save the kids and it's all about protecting the children and you flee at even the mention of the thing that's killing the kids, that should be fatal hypocrisy. And maybe it is, I mean, the fact that Republicans can't win national elections and so many of their most radical candidates, especially at the Senate level, lost. Maybe, you know, outside of places like Florida, it, it is fatal. It's just like it, it can't be said enough how how little they actually care about the substance of the things that they talk the most about. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Brett, for him? I, I think that, you know, the Donald Trump, whether he created it or crystallized it, more than anyone just didn't do the thing that everybody else was kind of goaded into doing, which is apologize or acknowledge wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Talking past the hypocrisy. Now, staying on messages 
always been something you do in politics, but talking past the hypocrisy, pretending it doesn't happen and, and not apologizing and actually going after people who are rightly accusing you of wrongdoing, that's a new thing. And he got away with it. And so everybody else is trying to as well. My garbage person of the week is this guy, Matt Couch, who has a big following on Twitter, some kind of right winger. He spread this video and it's a group of teens jumping another teen. And the reason he's on here is not just for this video or just for the caption that says, perhaps the Manhattan DA can investigate this group of thugs who viciously attacked and beat a 12 year old white capital W white girl in New York City. That would be bad enough using crime. Society shouldn't be prosecuted for their crimes would be bad enough, but it's worse. As um, we now have this tool on Twitter where you can add contextual information, and they did that. It's uh, the video is three years old. It's a 15 year old victim who was not white, and at least five people were arrested for it. So the facts are like all wrong. Even that's not true. The NYPD arrested a dozen people in reference to it. So the need to let Trump off the hook because they can't track down these teen criminals is outdated. And they did track them down. But then, after having it pointed out that all of the facts are wrong there, he then replies, apparently the kid was 15 and possibly not white, which now, according to the liberals and morons commenting, now makes this video okay. So even in that, he does not respond to the fact that the video is years old, so it's super weird that he's spreading it right now. But he's even more wrong than he's acknowledging there. And the added garbage. Is that the video is still up, by the way, and why wouldn't it be? It got nearly 13,000 retweets, 31,000 likes. Why not gain more clout when you're getting clout for free and nobody seems to care that what you're spreading was horribly racist initially and also wrong in basically every fact? Brett, what do you think? I mean, this is why I call it scornography in the same way that adult content frequently is just. Not very realistic, but people like get all into it and like, no, oh, this is their fantasy. This is his fantasy. It doesn't have to be based in reality. It has to have some trappings of like whatever he wants the world to be, plus a little bit of truth. Like, yes, there are pizza delivery people, but they don't show up and ask if we want to, you know. Anyways, but yeah, this is explicitly for the purpose of fantasy and emotional self pleasurement through rage or anger or indignance, but really this faux righteousness. And at the end of the day, they don't care if it's based in any sense of reality. Yeah, 100%. Well, those are our garbage people, but we also wanna shout out the 51,000 of you who voted for the community garbage person of the week. And here are your top five. This is actually a pretty split one. Coming at number five this week with 11% of the vote is the Texas judge pushing pro-life views during an abortion pill case. Honestly, there's been so much horrendous commentary and legislation around those sorts of issues. I'm not even sure what that one's referencing. Uh, but number four, 13% of the vote, it's college hockey player for pushing an amputee's wheelchair downstairs. Jesus. They were not in it. They were not they, in it. Okay. They were in the bathroom That's at the time. It was at the top of the stairs Still and they just pushed it out for fun. Absolutely horrendous. Number three, 20% of the vote, Sarah Huckabee Sanders for weakening child labor laws. That one I am familiar with, uh, just horrendous. Save the children so they can work. Number two, 20 of the vote is the House GOP for trying to protect Trump from an indictment throughout the week, and that will certainly continue. But uh, no, far and away, 35%, you have uh, Trump as the garbage person of the week for calling for protests for his potential indictment. And he won with like 14% of the vote uh, in advance or, or over and above number two. Can you imagine if they had known he was going to talk about death and destruction? I think he he earned his spot in the can this week. Thanks. Donald Trump. Okay, buddy, that is unfortunate all the time we have for the first hour of the show. Uh, so thank you to those of you on the linear platforms or listening on the podcast. But there is a lot more to come in the aftermath for those of you on Twitch, YouTube, the members app, a lot of other places, including the throwing away of the garbage people of the week and some other awesome news. So I hope to see you there.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.